Thank you very much indeed, sir. You set the, the event off with a great tone of um, seriousness but light-heartedness. And I will only say that on listening to Radio 4 driving into the university this morning and listening to the discussion about the latest IPCC report and the rather um, delicate and, and a concerning re report on climate change and the need for us to be far more proactive across the UK, across the globe, in our activities to really keep this planet in the way we would like to keep it for future generations. We need to be far more active, and it's never been a more important time for meeting to having some of the discussions we have today. So on that rather more sombre note, let's have a great day. It's fantastic to see so many people here. If you're visitors to the university, welcome. We really always appreciate our colleagues and friends from the region coming to join us when we talk about challenging issues, and there could be no more challenging issues than some of the ones that we're going to talk about during today's programme. So let me say something about YESI. YESI is an institution in this university. It was founded five years ago, and that's why we're here to celebrate. And in that five years, it's established itself as a huge force within the university, bringing together colleagues from across all three faculties to address some of the major global challenges of our time. And it was set up, and I, I read from, from the, um, the information that's provided for us today, to facilitate and deliver interdisciplinary research in environmental sustainability. Yes, he harnesses the talents of world-class researchers to generate the evidence base for sustainable solutions to global challenges, focusing on three key research themes, sustainable food, resilient eco ecosystems, and urban living. Yessi's approach is based on equal partnerships between social, physical, and life sciences, generating impacts at local, regional, and global scales. And I would say in my position as Pro-Vice-Chancellor for Research, Yessi is delivering. It's delivering for the university, it's delivering for the country, and it's delivering our global um, impact that we would like to have as a leading research-intensive university. So a few words of introduction for those of you who are not familiar with York and what we do here, just to put Yessi into context. And my first slide is about the university research strategy, which we launched in 2015 and have been implementing over the last three years. It runs to 2020 and has been pretty successful in terms of how we have focused and what we've delivered in terms of outputs, but also currently a 30% increase in our research income to do exciting world-leading research. So our vision then was that York would provide a home for some of the best research in the world and be regarded as one of the best places worldwide for research. And I think that vision encapsulates very much about what this university is about. And the, the research strategy is underpinned by a number of foundations that we thought were critical for success, the first of those being research excellence. We want to do things that are excellent. That's our drive. We wanted to be innovative. We wanted everything to have an international perspective, not just being inward-looking, but being outward-looking, outside the UK and outward into the world. We wanted our research to have impact. We wanted it to feature collaboration and partnership where it was critical to work with others. And we wanted all of our research to have integrity in its execution. So that was our vision and our foundations for success. And a key element of that vision was to think more collectively about our research endeavour and to launch seven overarching interdisciplinary research themes that would describe what the university was about. And those seven research themes, which were arrived at after much research and much discussion with colleagues across the university, are listed for you there. Creativity, culture and communication, environmental sustainability and resilience, health and well-being, justice and equality, risk, evidence and decision-making, and technologies for the future. And importantly, we recognised that we needed leadership 
to make these things happen, but more than leadership, we needed our senior colleagues to engage and to inspire other colleagues to join in and to make things happen. So we appointed seven university research theme champions to catalyze, you can tell I'm a biochemist because I think <laughs> cat catalysis describes this process really well, to catalyze activity. And my goodness, they've done just that. And we have much of our activity um, that's happened in the interim to thank those individuals for in terms of their role in helping to make things happen. And I think really importantly too, to engage with our more junior colleagues and our students to really bring them into the game and to bring them into our research aspirations. So this is where we come full circle because who else would be a better research champion for environmental sustainability and resilience? But Sue Hartley, who was appointed in a competitive process to be our research champion, to lead on this research theme, this university research theme, which aims to increase resilience in the face of short-term environmental shocks and long-term environmental change, while developing sustainable methods for mitigating adverse human impacts on the environment, which really encapsulates what we've been hearing about from the IPCC this morning. So Sue is our university research champion, and clearly YESI is the vehicle that is driving this agenda forward. And you're going to hear so much more about that drive and what's happening today. So just a quick word about what to expect. Um, keynote speakers, we're delighted to have Guy Vince here and Chris Thomas from our own biology department to give the keynote talks this morning. Um, there's an exhibition outside and a book signing, and you've probably already seen that as you came in. And there's also a showcase of YESI projects. Do take time to look at those. There's some fantastic work going on, and I know my colleagues will only be too happy to share their ideas and their progress with others. We have Claire Nuvian and Tom Whipple in conversation about marine conversation, um, conservation, conversation, conservation this afternoon, so please stay for that. A panel discussion and a drinks reception to end this day of celebration. I encourage you to stay for as long as you're able because we hope that these discussions and presentations are gonna be thought provoking, will allow us all to consider some of the major challenges that we face as a human population and will allow us to think about creative solutions and how we might all engage with that process. So welcome to the University of York. It's great to have you here. I'm really looking forward to introducing our speakers for the first session. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Chris Thomas from our Department of Biology. Um, FRS, and it's true to say, I think, Chris, I can say this as knowing you well for a long time, a tour de force in the university. And I think that will become apparent in his presentation today. So Chris is an ecologist and evolutionary biologist. He's interested in the dynamics of biological change, a very pertinent topic this morning. He's worked on a range of topics, particularly the movement of species and response to climate change, the principles underlying the survival and extinction of species in fragmented landscapes, and evolutionary changes in insects in response to climate change and habit habit habitat modification. He's interested in the development of conservation and environmental management strategies suitable for the increasingly dynamic world we inhabit. As a consequence of all of this work, he's recently published a book titled Inheritors of the Earth, How Nature is Thriving in an Age of Extinction. Chris, welcome. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. So, I'd like to start by reiterating one of the first things that Gaia said. We've only got one planet. We better not stuff it up. And as a scientist, I would far prefer it if we had multiple replicate Earths and we could, um, we could do the experiment that we're currently doing on this planet on one or a rather several replicate Earths and leave a few of them over in case it all goes horribly wrong. So we should be pessimistic. We should be pessimistic because pessimism helps us to identify the real challenges that we face that we can try to avoid. But nature, everything about nature, is a dynamic process. 
individuals of a particular population or species are born and die. They move from the location where they were born to another place. Um, and they disperse. So gradually, over time, they move around the surface of the planet. And species also evolve. We all have genetic variation within us. And as a population of humans here, there is a certain diversity of phenotype of individual characteristics. And when the environment changes, indeed, when, even when we change the environment, so as, for example, we start drinking milk as adults, certain genotypes are more successful than others. And so the uh, genes that children use for uh, the digestion of milk have, uh, are no longer turning off so much in uh, the adult population. And this is an evolutionary change that has been associated with the cultural development of humans and uh, our livestock. So when we think about the human modified Earth, we shouldn't think of this just-so planet, biological planet, that humans sort of were bust in from some outer space and disrupted. We emerged with it, within the system. It has changed in our presence, and it is continuing to change. And much as people are at the moment debating what date or day should we declare the Anthropocene to uh, start, it's evident that we're nowhere near the end of all of the changes that are going to take place. And what I want to talk about today um, is just really one aspect of all of the changes that are taking place. And that's what I'm calling the Anthropocene uh, pileup, or the New Pangaea, or if you like, the Pangean Archipelago, where the biological worlds of different islands, different continents, um, that had evolved more or less separately, but every so often there would be some transfer of one or another species to a new location when it, where it would then interact in its new homeland and evolve and diversify over time. And what we're doing to the planet at the moment is changing its surface so radically, we're changing the habitats where they are, and we're moving species from one location to another. To such an extent that there's never been, as far as we're aware, a time on Earth when the planet's species, um, at least not in the last uh, half uh, billion years, when the planet's species have become so mixed and this, if we, and the reason I'm concentrating on that today is if we think about the Anthropocene, if we were just to vanish all of you instantly, all of us humans just disappeared, and then we were to come back to the Earth in millions of years or tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years, the signature of this great transfer of species around the planet would still be obvious we would have changed the trajectory of evolution on Earth. And, and there's no going back on this. So, of course, we evolved within the system. Um, um, and um, so we are still very similar to our ape relatives or um, tailless monkey relatives. Um, and at the, top, at the bottom, we have a modern human, and at the top, um, we uh, have a, uh, a chimpanzee with a nasty case of hair loss. Um, and, um, but although you can see the body proportions are quite different, actually um, they're not so hugely dissimilar in many respects. And of course, they're enormously intelligent animals. So we've evolved within the system. We've developed all of this culture. And that has allowed us to, if you like, our population to take off, as we saw, and as Guy talked about, the great acceleration. And of course, fundamentally, the larger the human population grows, the um, more resources we use, per capita resource use across the planet is still going up, as well as human population is, um, 
and um, human population is going to continue to go up at least for a substantial fraction of, uh, at, at least until mid to uh, late of this century. And as humans capture a higher fraction of the primary production, the plant material that goes to feed us directly or our livestock, inevitably there is less left over for other life forms on Earth. And there's not, there's not really any easy way around this. So this is just one example of the Living uh, Planet Index, which is effectively a compilation of population trajectories of animals. Um, and this suggests that this uh, overall abundance of other stuff, non-human stuff, is going down as human population and consumption goes up. And of course, nearly all of the things that we are doing to try and make us more environmentally friendly in some way is actually not about reducing our consumption. It's not about reducing our human population. In fact, almost, both of those things are almost taboo. Um, whilst we have this sort of magic idea of, um, of forever economic growth. But um, what almost everything we're doing is looking at the efficiency of production and trying to minimise the amount of harm per, if you, in some, described in some way to the environment uh, as a function of that consumption. So can we make per unit energy consumption less harmful to the planet. And that's what we're trying to do rather slowly and belatedly. So with this extra consumption by humans, which isn't going to go away, um, it, we, can, we, can, um, we can do all sorts of environmentally friendly uh, things to our farmland and produce less food on our farmland in Britain. Jolly nice, I can go for a walk down the road, I can hear more skylarks, but I can assure you I'm therefore going to import more food and still eat it. And so I'm, all I'm going to be doing is exporting that environmental impact to somewhere else. So we are in a situation where people are speculating are we now reaching the point that we are entering the so-called six maths extinction? So here are some of the, the five big, so-called big five mass extinctions. N Cretaceous, that's the one that um, um, uh, killed the large uh, plodding birds um, whilst um, the flying uh, feathered uh, birds uh, survived. Um, so we've got these mass extinctions, um, and people have got asking, are we causing the six big, big six mass extinction? I think it's very unfortunate this conversation has actually arisen, because if we decide we're not in the big six extinction, oh, then it's fine. We're only killing off 10% of the uh, planet species. There's absolutely nothing to worry about, guys. Um, so, so this is a, a bit of a challenge, and I think I would, I would challenge scientists, I might have a go at it myself at some point, of, well, actually, are we in the top 100 already? Are we in the top 50? Where are we in mass extinctions? And I think thinking about us moving down a hierarchy of extinction uh, strengths would be a, uh, a better way to look at this uh, rather than a yes, no, are we in the big sixth? But what I want to uh, so emphasize here is that we really are making a big impact. So for, if you look at the IUCN Red List, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, they say that about two, just about 2% of mammal species have become extinct since 1500. Of course, the number that went extinct between 1500 and 1550 is very likely underestimated. Um, if we um, add in the uh, 178 species that uh, Tony Banoski and colleagues have uh, suggested have gone extinct um, with mainly from uh, direct human predation on large mammals that couldn't reproduce as fast as we were killing them, uh, you can see that this started more or less uh, about 55,000 years ago in Australia in a big way, although there were dribs and drabs of extinctions before that. Then humans started killing them off in Eurasia and Beringia, which is the bit between um, um, current Russia and uh, Alaska. 
Uh, then people got into the Americas and there was a great big crash of uh, human, of the number of these huge species. Um, meanwhile, the human population uh, is going up. And in fact, it's remarkable. It's an amazing achievement. Well done, humans. An amazingly small number of humans killed off an incredibly large number of very large animals. That's really absolutely extraordinary achievement. So they've gone, um, uh, although some people are now working on trying to bring their genes back and try and recreate, uh, for example, mammoth step again from a sort of hybridized version of mammoth genes implanted into Indian elephant um, stock. Um, and it might work, but of course, um, we know that it's a bit tricky keeping large and fierce animals around the place. Um, and so uh, it may not be completely ideal to repatriate them everywhere across the planet's surface. But one of the characteristics after a more or less an unknown delay period of the previous big five mass extinctions has been an increase in diversity. This is measured as numbers of families up here um, after these mass extinctions. And there are big delays after the mass extinction before um, the diversity is restored. And in some cases, particularly in the last 250 million years, the uh, diversity has then gone up to higher than it was before the mass extinction. Now, part of this, you can see that there's quite a delay before this, the peak is sort of recovered, if you like. But, but remember, these are families, and it does indeed take many millions of years for two things that are evolving to become so different that we would regard them as different families of plants or different families of animals. So it could be that diversity starts to increase in, at, a, at a lower level at the same time as the mass extinction, responding to some of the same environmental changes. And that's unlikely to have been the case, for example, when uh, a large lump of rock and ice and so on uh, fell out of the skies and uh, killed off the dinosaurs. But um, some of these other mass extinctions were really very slow um, by modern standards. And so perhaps uh, diversification started almost immediately. So we may be having a mass extinction. Let's say it's a mini mass extinction that kills off, say, 15, 20% of the species on the planet. We don't know. But the things we're doing, because we're changing the environment, rather than stop evolution, of course, when the environment changes, things do evolve. Now, extinction and the loss of populations do represent, you can think of that as a failure of evolution to keep up. The population that was there couldn't evolve fast enough to deal with the new situation that now exists. And therefore, the in number of individuals dying consistently exceeded the number being born. But We've all got genetic variation. Every population, pretty much of every species, has genetic variation. So some things are going to be more successful. And coupled with that, to go back to my original theme, is that we're moving species to new parts of the world where they're encountering new environments, they're encountering new sets of species. And this, in itself, the new interactions between species, is going to stimulate a great deal of additional evolution, in just the same way that uh, Ascension Island has got all of these new species that are now uh, interacting and uh, in a community that didn't exist previously. And of course, some of these, particularly species living when continental species um, like this one arrives in Guam and eats its way through bird species that either are flightless or uh, nearly so, or simply don't recognize the thing as a predator. Um, and this is what Stuart Pym described as the bird that, uh, the snake that ate Guam. And so when you mix up all of the species on the planet, it is inevitable that they're not going, all going to be able to coexist with one another. 
But nearly all of the extinctions are on places like Oceanic Islands where uh, continental species have arrived to which the natives had no uh, defences, or uh, equivalent on land, if you like, where new fish species have come into lakes where there were a whole bunch of endemics. But one of the consequences of all of this movement is that nearly all countries in the world, all regions in the world, contain many more species than they did. It doesn't mean the whole sp planet's got more species, but each region has now got more species than it used to. So this is for Oceanic Islands. These are, this is on a log scale, this is, uh, is not. Um, but the one-to-one -one lines are here. So any circle has, that's above this line, the current number of species of plant is higher than it used to be, as best could be reconstructed of the original flora. Uh, for oceanic islands, it's roughly a doubling of the number of plant species so far, but there's no hint that it's reached an end yet. Uh, and continental areas, um, U US states and European countries mainly on this, um, it's about, on average, a 20% increase in the number of species per region. That's a bit higher for Britain. So, nearly all of these species have arrived and established without actually exterminating native species. And we see the same thing for vertebrates. Uh, the black line is showing the importance that policy can work for, for uh, mammals at least. This is for New Zealand that was gaining all these uh, mammals and then they put in a strict policy of uh, keeping them out. And this is for Europe, this line here of the number of non-native mammal species established in Europe. And although some native mammals have declined substantially, the, the, you'll all be familiar with the grey squirrel, red squirrel story in Britain um, and and the possible uh, uh, recovery of red squirrel, which is now very speculative, that, that could become associated with uh, pine martin uh, recovery. But what Europe has undoubtedly got now is more species of mammal than it used to. And actually, because they come from different parts of the world, they're more unrelated to one another than the originals. And so we have this kind of paradox that this big input of species, and we all say, we've all signed up to say we like biodiversity, but we are putting a human cultural uh, interpretation on which species, which elements of this biodiversity we like or not. And so this is the lovely case of the house sparrow that's not native here because it's only here because of agricultural uh, development and uh, urban areas. It's, it it colonised. There are probably early agriculture in the Fertile Crescent spread uh, across the world with human agriculture. In uh, North America, it actually had... Well, we helped it to get there. There was somebody who liked Shakespeare and decided to introduce all of the bird species that, um, that Shakespeare ever mentioned, and the house sparrow was one of them. Um, and they don't... Uh, that, and, and so it's jolly good, <laughs> it's pretty lucky, I suppose, that Shakespeare was not a, one of the world's greatest ornithologists. I, um, if, I, I don't know where he is, I knew he came in, John Lawton came into the, uh, into, somewhere in the room, if he'd written um, Shakespeare's sonnets, uh, the whole world would be completely coated in species. But that's not the case. So in North America, same bird, it's only in North America because of humans, it's only in the UK because of humans, but basically we, uh, we are trying to conserve it in the UK because there are slightly fewer than there were because apparently the number of sparrows we had in 1970 was the correct number of sparrows. And uh, in North America, the sparrow has also declined a little bit for, since the 1970s, but there they wish to, if they, or a lot of people would like to exterminate it completely. Um, but it's the same species, same ecological effects. And so us taking these different attitudes to species depending on how long they've been somewhere, exactly how we interact, this is a really subjective thing. 
Um, scientists can sort of describe what's going on, but we can't really tell people what you should or shouldn't feel about this. And in fact, as the language of conservation moves into all the ecosystem goods and benefits that people obtain from nature, it tends to be the common and widespread species that provide us with the largest number of those uh, potential benefits. But um, if it's um, a common and widespread species, and we declare it to be native, then, then we say this is wonderful. But if it's a common and widespread species and it's only been in the area for a few centuries, then we declare that it is mainly harmful. And almost any species anywhere has some positive and some negative effects. And therefore, it's very easy to be able to choose your effects to decide which of these two categories any particular species might fall into. So, yes, but this is a disaster, you say. And it's completely true that a substantial fraction of all of the world's species-level extinctions that have taken place in the last 500 years have been caused by invasive species, as I say, particularly uh, those arriving on um, oceanic islands. And, of course, if you think of humans as hunters, as us as invading species as well. And so... Um, but what happens in the very long run? Well, perhaps the best example we've got of this is where North and South America um, sort of came into contact with one another. Um, of course, there wasn't a sort of magic date that the two continents are completely separate, and then bang, and they were together. So the connection of the continents took place over millions of years, whereas us moving species between continents now is, is taking place over centuries to a few thousand years. So over millions of years, Gradually, what there was a more and more north um, lineages that started off in North America, these sort of purpley blue ones, uh, arrived in South America, and some of the South American lineages arrived in North America. And they diversified there. And if we look at this, um, this graph here, you can see that by, the, by a few million years after the connection of North and South America, it turns out now, even though there were some extinctions like the saber-toothed um, marsupial cats in uh, South America, um, the reality was that, um, that eventually diversity was higher in both continents as a result of the mixing of species. So species had arrived, gone from one continent to another, and then they diversified into many habitats. There are now more species of deer in South America than there are in North America, despite the fact that the deer colonized from the north to the south. So, OK, <laughs> I'm going to be long gone in um, another two million years. Um, but um, are we starting to see the beginning of this process? And the answer is yes. So nature isn't just taking it lying down, as it were. So here's um, a, uh, a rather nice butterfly called Taylor's checker spot. It's not a full species, it's a subspecies. But this subspecies um, only survives in North America because it's undertaken an evolutionary change to, um, so that its caterpillars now feed actually on this plant here, Plantago lancea later, um, ribwort plantain, a common meadow grass uh, plant that was introduced to North America in um, livestock feed and spread around North America with um, the European uh, colonists. It was known as white man's footprints. In fact, it was so reliably turned up wherever people um, um, from Europe of European origins colonized. So this is now a conservation uh, sort of issue because it's very rare still, but it's only feeding on this European plant. And uh, very interestingly, there's a program, well, I thought it was interesting anyway. There's a program at a penitentiary or a women's penitentiary um, where they're actually. Um, rearing these butterflies, and they're preparing Plantago lancea later to plant out in the wild to save this species, or subspecies. But then we've got things that are near enough new species. This is, the, um, this is actually on the hawthorn, but we've got the apple fly that has evolved in the last couple of hundred years 
so that it's got a life cycle physiology and behavior entirely associated with breeding with apples. And um, the geneticists are now, they, they argue about, is it really a separate species? But I think that if we were to not know about its historical past, we would decide that actually it was so specialized on apple that it was near enough for its own separate species. And three parasitic parasitoid wasp that um, seek out the grubs of these things also now hunt on, exclusively on apples. So one species of European plant or Asian plant arrives and um, four native insects switch onto it become adapted to it. And it's a matter of, we can argue to the cows come home as to whether they're separate species or not, yet it doesn't really matter. Obviously, speciation is a continuous process. But that diversion, that evolutionary adjustment to the new mixture of species is already happening. And in some cases, you're getting two species of a, either two species have arrived from different parts of the world, or one species has arrived and has met so-called native species, and they have enjoyed one another's company sufficiently that they reproduce. And uh, in going back to the house sparrow, when it arrived in uh, southern Europe, it met this thing called the Spanish sparrow, and this is their offspring, the Italian sparrow, which uh, now has quite stable hybrid zone at the north of the Italian peninsula, apparently, and is pretty much as good as any other bird species. But it, ar it arose entirely because humans altered habitats and started to develop agriculture, allowing uh, these birds to move in. Um, and today, the hybrid Italian sparrow um, is completely confined to human-modified habitats and mainly breeds in towns and villages. So now to Britain, where we've, here's, here's a European hybrid that's arrived. It's met groundsel and um, produced in York, this thing called Senecio iberosensis, which disappeared again. And actually, when you grow it, I have tried growing it, and it's a pretty useless plant, so I don't think it's going to make it. Um, whereas Senecio cambrensis, which is also a hybrid between Oxford ragwort and groundsel, uh, is doing a little bit better. So we're getting new hybrid uh, forms coming into existence. And this one I like particularly, the monkey flowers, two species of monkey flower, one from North America, one from South America. They met on a streamside in Scotland. They generated um, a, uh, non, a um, vegetative um, form because they've got different chromosome numbers. They couldn't reproduce sexually. Then there was a doubling of the chromosome number accidentally. And now their hybrid offspring can uh, reproduce sexually. And because it's got double this number of cro chromosomes, it's this one's completely genetically isolated. Uh, here's um, um, Spartina anglica, which is spread around the uh, North American versus European species hybrid that's now spread around the world. And here's one that's completely in cultivation, the Q primrose. So I tried to do a sort of back of envelope calculation of what the speciation rate is. So the value here on this axis is the speciation rate measured in numbers of new species generated per million species years. So that means if you've got a million species, you'd expect to get one new species uh, a year on average. 10 would be, so 10 new species per million species. So if you try to calculate, this is a very dodgy calculation, but it's the first attempt to do so, really to ask the question as to what the speciation rate is. And so these are the estimates. The black dots are for uh, all plants, as best we know, are the historic speciation uh, rates, which is down here. And this is using just the speciation rate of plants in Britain in the last 300 years. And the estimated speciation rate for Britain, nearly all, because species have arrived from different parts of the world, have met one another and hybridized and formed new genetic forms, is about two orders of magnitude higher than it was. So at least we shouldn't ignore the speciation rate as an input to the world's diversity. 
Now, if we go back to the IUCN red list, and I don't think this is complete, but neither is the list of new species, the IUCN red list only um, says that one plant species has become completely globally extinct that was a European plant in this same time. I don't think that can be right, but the number of new species we know about in Europe um, is, um, is a very small fraction of the number that must really exist. So the number of new ones in Britain is more than the number we know have gone extinct in Europe. And if we look at North America as well, continental North America, also there's more new hybrid species have been formed there in the last few centuries than native species have gone extinct globally. Of course, many have declined hugely, um, and that might be what we won't care about. But in the very long run, what we might expect is that all of these animals and plants living in new parts of the world are going to diverge, we're starting to see this process, start to diverge into forms that we would eventually recognize as natives of each area. And this yellow star thistle is about 50% incompatible already within uh, in about a century or a century and a half. Um, it's already about 50% incompatible with its ancestors that lived in Spain and Portugal. So we know that when you introduce species like rodents to South America, eventually they, uh, they diverge into a very large number of new species. We have already moved tens of thousands of species around the planet, probably getting on for between uh, five and 10% of species, depending on the group, um, and they are eventually going to undertake this massive divergence unless we exterminate them. So, we should think of this as a continuously changing world in which, yes, we must recognize the losses and do whatever we can to stop the losses that we care about, but diversity change is about gains as well as losses. And it seems to me that it's as legitimate for us to consider what are what changes could we foster that would be beneficial to humanity, let's say, and our perception of the environment, as to try and prevent the losses? So that we should be simultaneously pessimistic, because we don't want to go there, and optimistic, because actually this good Anthropocene might be possible. So it's different. Just get used to it. There's no point in thinking, Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't the medieval world have been lovely, despite all those nasty pathogens that would have stopped you reaching the age that about half of you are already? Nature, as I put it, it wasn't in a perfect state when we turned up and sort of ruined it. Sure, we can make many things worse for humans, but with this... Um, this um, <clears throat> fine fresco here that was looking a bit tatty. Um, uh, very helpful lady who worked in, um, um, in the cathedral or church or whatever it was, uh, decided that she would help out even more than cleaning the floors. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, if she was ever a wonderful artist, it was slight, she was slightly past her best artistic work by the time she had a go at it. But sometimes I think we try and turn nature back to something which is as much in our imagination as it was a real past exact state of the world. So thank you very much. Um, and I think even if we've just generated a few new species in the planet and that there's we know that there's bunches of, new spe of species that are living in new places. We have to ask ourselves, to what, F what extent do we decide that we dislike the new things of the Anthropocene and try and put it back? And to what extent do we just accept this and go with the changes? And once we've decided that it's acceptable to go with at least some of the changes, then we have a whole series of very horrible and contentious discussions and decisions as to when we decide that we actually want to promote further change because it actually adjusts the biological world to this physically altered planet that we have created, and when do we try and stop it. So thank you very much.
Oh, I'm so impressed too. So some thought-provoking um, ideas there and questions I'm quite sure from this audience. So who'd like to get us started in the front here? Can we have a mic here, please? Perhaps you'll introduce yourself as we did before. Thanks. Hello there. Um, I'm John Cossum. I'm the, uh, my claim to fame is I'm a winner of the Oxfam Carbon Footprint Competition for the lowest carbon footprint in the UK in 2008. 100 people took part. Um, my, I'm, I'm, I almost asked this question of Gaia, but held back. Um, <laughs> um, I'll pass it in on. fact, Gaia, Gaia um, <laughs> asked, um, what would make a good Anthropocene? And my question to her was, uh, would a good Anthropocene have to have humans in it? So what I'd, I'd like to ask you, Chris, is do you see Homo sapiens um, coming to an end and maybe Homo sensibilis evolving out of the wreckage <laughs> that we are going to be, we are causing? Well, um, mm, I think that's one for the bar. Um, <laughs> the, who knows? So, so I think that my, so, okay, what's a good, how can we minimize our footprint on the planet, which was one of the questions I think that uh, Guy was asked that a sort of couple of times in different ways. And obviously the solution to that is that we all top ourselves instantly um, because the fewer humans there are on the planet, the lower the total um, impact of us is. So what does a good Anthropocene look like? I suppose it is, for me, I, it is a world in which we, whatever we do, we adjust our minds to the fact that the human population might decline. And because at the moment, various countries seeing declining birth rates are starting to put policies in place that would put the birth rate back up. That would be an enormous challenge. We are in a good Anthropocene. I would suggest we're still going to consume a lot, however many, um, whatever one's individual <coughs> views might be. Most people don't want to reduce the rate of their consumption as a whole. So, so what we've really got to work on is absolutely minimizing the per individual um, and completely transforming the per individual impact of what we do consume. So, for example, if we're not all going to become vegetarians or vegan, then can we transform, once we've got plenty of renewable energy, can we transform to factory-grown animal muscle, which is our primary source of meat. That would then lead to a huge reduction in the required footprint if we could keep the average consumption in the human population. So I think we should, uh, I wonder the thing, so for me I suppose I would say that peak land use is a nice concept to think about as for the Anthropocene of can we turn land use downwards rather than ever increasing. Some people think we may already have reached it, but I think as people talked about peak carbon, it would be nice if in the next 30, 40 years, the main discussion started to move towards, once we've sorted climate change out, to move to peak land. I'm an incredible optimist. So I think these two gentlemen are going to meet in the bar later. Others may like to join them. So other questions? One along here, please. My name is John Bibby from York Bus Forum and Mass World UK. Um, I'm sure you must have considered the question of whether some sort of cost-benefit analysis could be useful in answering the sorts of questions that you've uh, posed. Uh, and I'd like to ask, well, two questions, really. Well, one is, um, what sort of cost-benefit, if any, <laughs> uh, cost-benefit analysis, if any, could be useful? And uh, so specific, if we were to do a cost-benefit analysis of the dodo, of the extinction of the dodo, um, what sort of numbers would we be trying to use in the assessment? We're humans. This is the problem and the solution. Um, so 
with a high proportion of all of our interactions with nature, even when we try and put a pound or dollar or euro sign on that, is that we are effectively expressing a human preference for one state or another. And I'm not saying, not in the sense of doing a survey, a willingness to pay a survey, but effectively via our, um, our democracies, via our political systems, etc., we're deciding how much effort am I putting into nature conservation versus something else, for example. And those opinions, those cultural, what is seen as culturally normal, if you like, changes rather rapidly. So, so I think that it's hard to, to think that the costs, so costs and benefits are fantastic because they stop us doing stupid things now that no one may think are sensible because if you um, pay to um, put drainage ditches in the uplands that feed the river ooze, in, that goes through York and then have to spend more money on, um, on flood defences, that's obviously stupid. But one of the difficulties of cost-benefit analysis is that it prioritises what we think is important today, because that, whereas I would argue that we should think much longer term as a global resilience, and I am not prepared to bet what we will think is important in the biological world, other than the essentials of food, drink, etc., um, in 150 years' time. So I'm rather nervous about doing it um, too much like as a cost-benefit, other than as to um, guide short-term management decision-making. So other one right in the middle here. If you can get the mic across. Uh, Chris West from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, I just wondered, um, given the pace of change that humans are imposing on uh, the natural system at the moment, um, is it likely with this potential speciation event that it's only going to be species with fast life histories that actually thrive? And will we just be inundated with new species of weedy plants and insects as a result? Um, it sort of was always thus. Um, most species are small and have fast life cycles. Um, so it's certainly true if you look at mammals, it's the, um, which we are particularly prized for food, of course, it's the, the, the extinction of the megafauna has been because the rate at which they reproduce is lower than the rate at which we kill them. And those those that survive and diversify in the future, the ones that diversify in the future can only come from those that survive the initial period. But I don't particularly, so whenever people start talking about life histories and fast and short and um, uh, I'm not, yes they're relevant to the discussion, but don't seem to explain a huge variation because it doesn't matter what your life cycle is if the entirety of the habitat in which you live disappears. Um, and you can argue that a short-lived thing can bounce back fastest, but a long-lived thing from a tree might be able to survive a century without reproducing. And so, so I don't think there's a sort of silver bullet, life history bullet, if you like. Um, and if you think of large mammals, of course, there are very many more large mammals on the planet, individuals, than there ever were previously because of our domestic animals. The biomass of them is perhaps seven times larger than it was um, before humans came along and started to domesticate any large animals. OK, any more before we move on? Can't see any hands, but maybe I'm missing something. Yes, one here, <laughs> lady. Um, Mike's coming to you. I was just wondering there, as you were talking about how you see the genetic footprint and man's effect on the genetic footprint affecting the course of the planet. I'm not sure 
what you're meaning by genetic footprint? Here? Well, the way we tamper with DNA and, and make ah, right. different okay. types so, of corn and different animals. So right? obviously, quite a lot of our quite a lot of our crop species, of course, are uh, hybrids that have been either. De we don't really know, I think, how many of them were deliberately generated or the hybrids came into existence by chance. People saw them and thought, oh, that's a good thing, I'll cultivate that. But if you look through the top 100 um, um, food stuffs that we grow as humans, a substantial fraction of those are already genetically mixed. Now, today, we have much greater capacity, much faster, to move genes between one species and another. Um, of course, that could be harmful under some circumstances. You could, um, um, you know, some crazy biologist in a lab somewhere could, um, uh, could, could do something unmentionable. But if I'm thinking about the world's wildlife, I would say this is this great opportunity because there's a whole bunch, well, there aren't very many of them left, but the Hawaiian honey creepers, for example, are not resistant to bird malaria. Similarly, there's large numbers of frogs around the world that have been dying off because of chytrid fungal infections. Well, can we use some of these technologies to insert the genes for resistance and produce what viable populations, again, of species that are in danger? Because otherwise, we're left treating a sort of terminal patient forever. Um, and that is, that is not the ideal solution. It's an interesting area, isn't it? Genetically modifying organisms and then introducing them back into what was their natural environment often has very deleterious. Well, it's experience. interesting because people are going gung-ho for hybrid elephants and yep. mammoths. Mm -hmm. um, and the moment we've done that, of course, it rather crosses a sort of conceptual bridge because mm -hmm. we've created something deliberately that didn't exist before, yeah. even though it's sort of modelled on mm -hmm. something that existed mm -hmm. before. And we're releasing it into the wild because we think, well, it would be economically valuable. I'd go and see it, that's for sure. <laughs> um, and, um, and, um, and so economically it would be worth it. And there's this discussion as to whether it was really important to, to uh, maintaining certain types of ecosystem mm -hmm. that could be useful to bring back. So, um, but, but once you've decided, yes, a new thing is OK, and you release, have released it into the wild, then there's no particular stop to doing this. And why not just take any two things that haven't existed previous, that, to any two species, and generate a new hybrid, and let them go? I mean, it's the same thing effectively, if you thought that that product was going to be useful in some way. I, I, I think that we probably need to think through the consequences of some of these things. As, as indeed we are in terms of genetically modifying um, vectors yeah. of, of particular pathogenic yeah. diseases, yeah. which is a fine example of... But I would argue that the, the technologies have come into existence. I think it was Ottoline Lisa who used to argue mm -hmm. that um, that when people invented computers, people can do bad things with computers, they can do good things with computers. We shouldn't decide that we should throw away all computers. And similarly with these genetic technologies, that we can clearly do some things that would achieve goals that we in some way as humans think would be beneficial to us and our appreciation of the environment, but it is absolutely certainly within our capacity to do things that are harmful as well. Um, whether by banning the good things that we could do would thereby stop people doing the bad things is, is rather questionable. That's probably another topic for a discussion in the pub at another time, I think, as we move more into that direction. So I think we are just about out of time, Chris, and if we're going to finish in time for lunch, we should draw this presentation to a close. So thank you very much indeed, a very intriguing presentation. Thank you. Let me just say something more about Sue that you may not know. She is a community ecologist, her professional training and is recognised internationally for her work on the interactions between organisms, 
particularly plants and herbivores. Obviously, we know she founded Jesse, and she's the university research champion. She was also the founding academic director for the NA Agri-Food Resilience Program in 2015, and she's currently a co-lead on the CCAN Centre, and I think there's a demonstration of that outside, um, and you can find out more about that. Um, you may not know she's a board member of Natural England and has the delight of uh, sometimes dealing with the Secretary of State mm -hmm. in her capacity there. She's chair of the Sustainable Agricultural Research Innovation Club, She's a trustee of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew and a former president of the British Ecological Society. So is now going to tell us, uh, I think, in, in 15 minutes or so, about the first five years of YESI, a potted version of what's been going on. So, welcome. Thank you, Debbie, for that uh, lovely introduction. And... Uh, Thank you to our pre two previous speakers for a, a fantastic introduction to the challenges and uh, indeed opportunities of the Anthropocene. And what I'd like to do now is introduce you a little bit to what YESI has been up to in the first uh, five years and think a little bit about uh, where we might be going uh, in the future. And uh, over lunch, there's an ex exhibition and you can see a lot uh, more information about uh, YESI work, and I encourage you to do that. And this afternoon, we're going to have uh, talks from some uh, of the leaders of YESI projects. So what I'm going to focus on just now is the, the kind of ethos of YESI, what we're about and what we want to achieve. So we've already heard that uh, we're certainly having impacts on our planet. We're destroying some of our forest habitats, our cities are expanding, um, as Gaia was saying. Uh, agriculture, our intensive agriculture, is using a lot of resources. Uh, agriculture currently uses about 70% of the world's fresh water. <coughs> and uh, we've already heard mention today of the new IPCC report. We're struggling to control our greenhouse gas emissions. But we've heard about pessimism and optimism. I'm firmly a glass half full sort of girl, especially if it's got gin and tonic in it. And uh, I think there is cause for optimism. Uh, here we've got students on a BS and TBA sponsored course learning about uh, tropical forestry generation, how to protect our habitats. This is our new environment and geography department building here at York, uh, very uh, environmentally sustainable and uh, Never let it be said, we let the grass grow under our feet. And uh, this is one of the very first YESI projects, which was uh, joint with uh, CNAP, the Centre for Novel Agricultural Products, and they have a, a stand here. And this was on trying to make uh, rice more resilient to climate change, using genes from wild ancestors through conventional breeding, not GM, but to take resilient strains of rice and uh, that are more, more tolerant of drought and flooding and try and breed those into elite cultivars. So there are things we can do to address the challenges. And in terms of energy, renewable energy technologies are also moving on apace. So the challenge, I think, that we face was summarised very nicely by John Beddington, who, of course, was a lecturer uh, in the biology department here at York uh, at the same time as I was doing my PhD, so I think it's fair to say it was a while ago. Um, but he summarised the situation uh, very well, saying that we would have some sort of perfect storm, really, of needing 50% more food, 50% more energy, and 30% more water by 2030, and to uh, deliver all that in the face of climate change. But I think another summary of our situation was this quote here from Ban Ki-moon, a former Secretary General of, uh, of the UN. And I think he summarised really what, what YESI is all about. We need to connect the dots between climate, poverty, energy, food and water. We can't tackle these issues in isolation. And I guess to summarise YESI, I would say... It's about joining dots. It's about joining the dots between disciplines. It's about bringing different departments together, different sorts of research expertise. Because as Gaia said so nicely earlier, 
that solutions emerge through collaboration. And the SE is all about collaboration and promoting collaboration. So we were set up um, to provide an interdisciplinary partnership to generate these solutions to uh, global challenges. And we're very much focused on solutions. And we want to try and deliver those solutions through world-class uh, research. Uh, Debbie was saying earlier about the emphasis on research excellence here at York. And we want to deliver research that's useful not just for other researchers, but if we're going to make a difference to these challenges we face, we need to have research that's of use uh, for industry, for policymakers. And we're very firm believers in equal partnerships. So many interdisciplinary institutes have an emphasis on uh, life or, or sciences or physical sciences and not a fair representative from social sciences or the other way around. And we recognise that dealing with these problems, we need equal respect for the disciplines. So we were launched in 2013. We can count to five. Um, and our aim was to facilitate collaborations across campus to develop these new synergies between disciplines and to develop networks with uh, different research communities, both within the university and beyond, and to focus on societal challenges where interdisciplinary research brings added value. Now, we recognise in YESI that we need that disciplinary strength. Not everything should be interdisciplinary. Um, but we build that interdisciplinarity from the strength and depth in individual disciplines. So we recognise that research strength through our research themes. And we've got three of those. Sustainable food. And that's led by Bob Doherty from the York Management School. And you'll hear from him and his colleagues later this afternoon. And the focus there is on sustainable methods of food production. But we recognise that we can't grow our way out of the current challenges. So we also uh, work on supply chain resilience and on reducing food waste and changing consumer behaviour. And our next theme is led by Jane Hill from Biology on resilient ecosystems. And the focus there is very much on uh, biodiversity, climate change and ecosystem services. And our last theme is led by Alistair Boxall from the Department of Environment and Geography. And the focus there is on uh, urban living, so pollution assessment and health and well-being in, this, in our increasingly urbanised world. More than half of us already live in cities and that proportion is increasing very rapidly. And in your uh, attractive little Yesi bags, you have our Yesi brochure, which tells you more about the research themes. And you also have um, a little research portfolio, which has got these uh, nice little summaries of particular projects. So I'd encourage you to look through those, to uh, hear the talks this afternoon, and to talk uh, to the exhibitors. So I'm not going to talk more about our projects. What I am going to do is, is try and say how we facilitate those kind of interdisciplinary projects. And over the lifetime of YESI so far, we've had over 100 researchers from 17 different departments within the University of York work on YESI projects and proposals. And also in the YESI brochure, you can read about the different uh, things that we can offer collaborators. And on our website as well, we have some uh, pages around partnering with, with us and what we can offer. And we can look for new funding opportunities for, for exciting ways to help you develop your research. We can support you finding collaborators within the university and beyond. And we can help you develop your project proposals. But we don't just do that within the university. We've worked with over 130 industry, non-government organisations, uh, public bodies, charities, research institutes. We've formed partnerships very, very widely. And 
as Debbie's already said, we've, we've uh, within the university, have a, a very large program called N8 AgriFood. Um, and that is a collaboration between the eight northern research intensive universities uh, led out of York and looking at a, a whole food system uh, approach. And again, directed towards providing solutions. So YESI is very uh, engaged with other organisations like N8 AgriFood. Now, one of the other ways that we promote our research interactions and research collaborations is through our networks. And uh, over lunch, you can sign up to some of these to these networks. There's a laptop enabling you to sort of join them. And we've got one on waste and resource use, led by James Chong from Biology, one on tropical ecosystems, led by Rob Marchant in, in Environment and Geography. And our newest one is on climate change, uh, led by Kevin Cowton from Department of Chemistry. And what these networks do is bring different uh, researchers together with different perspectives to try and tackle these particularly pressing issues. So for waste, for example, we look at all sorts of waste, from plastics to food waste to managing waste in refugee camps. So any sort of aspect of these topics we cover through these, in, these networks, which span campus and beyond. Now, I've mentioned that we want our research to have impact, to make a difference. And how can we do that? Well, we can do it by being quite successful in the amount of funding that we can attract and so the projects that we can support. But I wanted to highlight just three different ways we could have impact. So our very first YESI project was a £50,000 pump priming project between chemistry, biology and electronics. And it was to devise a new way of autonomously measuring greenhouse gas emission in field environments. And that was called SkyGas, and there's a little model of SkyGas out in uh, the reception there that James is going to show you. And that has progressed to Skyline 2D, which is a commercial product based on able, being able to do this in difficult to measure environments. So we support um, uh, innovation through technology that can address that kind of key problem. But we also want to have impact um, through our corporate, through corporate responsibility. So one of our projects you'll hear about this afternoon is called Sensor Socially and Environmentally Sustainable Oil Palm Research. So how can we help companies minimize uh, any adverse impacts they have from that kind of activity? So we're very engaged with that. And Debbie's already mentioned CCAN, the Centre for Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus, one of the world's worst titles, but it was uh, ESRC's idea, not ours. But the nexus being the intersect between food, uh, energy, environment, and water. And CCAN is led out of the University of Surrey, but we take responsibility here at York for the environmental aspects. And we're trying to evaluate government policy government environmental policy and identify what works and uh, what doesn't. Um, and one of the areas we're most active in is developing post-Brexit agri-environment and sustainable fisheries policies. Yes, Brexit. <laughs> Moving on. So what YESI is really about, of course, is what do we want our future to look like? Intensive agriculture has done a huge amount of benefits, actually, for many of us. It's also doing quite a lot of environmental harm. So can we have a different approach, a more environmentally sustainable approach to food production? And how can the sort of interdisciplinary research that YESI does help us move from here to here? And that way, we'll be able to have that same kind of enjoyment in the natural world uh, that this little lad is demonstrating. And we all, some of that kind of activity might be uh, slightly beyond the capability of some of us. I've got an artificial hip for a start. But we all recognise that sentiment. 
We want our world to be better for future generations. And that's what YESI is aiming to do. And I just want to tell you a little bit now about what's going to happen next. So we're then going to have, we're going to have a lunch break. So um, university catering might not fill you with the sort of unbridled joy you see here, but we have laid on a nice spread, and there's a chance to meet YESI researchers and uh, see the ex exhibitors and find out more. There's also a book stand where you'll be able to buy uh, Gaia's book, signed copies, Chris's book, signed copies, lots of other books, actually. Sadly, I haven't written a book. I missed a trick there. But um, <laughs> you'll be able to do that. And then we're going to come back after lunch, and you're going to hear much more about the work of Yessi from the people who were really doing their work, who are de developing the interdisciplinary innovations that make a real difference and help us move to a more environmentally sustainable future. Thank you.